Everybody, it's Dr. Eric Balkavage. We, we're back for another edition of the Thyroid Answers podcast today. We've got another guest. Her name is Lisa Hendrickson Jack. You might remember her. She was on the podcast, I don't know, maybe two or three years ago. She's a fertility awareness educator. Um, and she is back on the podcast because she's got a new book out called Real Food for Fertility. So we're going to kind of have this conversation with her again about fertility, maybe the things that are driving infertility in this country, and especially for people with thyroid-related issues. And we're going to talk about her book that just will be coming out very shortly and maybe already out by the time this podcast is out. So Lisa, welcome back to the Thyroid Answers Podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Always nice to talk to you. Thanks so much for having me back. So you're a first time official author. Well, second, third time second author. Time, you were first the, time you were co-author. One, right? yeah. Yes. So technically, this is the third book. I wrote The Fifth Vital Sign, and then I, I published my fertility awareness uh, charting uh, workbook, which is for those who love paper charting. And now I've co-authored Real Food for Fertility with Lily Nichols. And this is a project we've been working on for almost three years. So really excited to get it out. So give the give the listeners a little bit of background about you, how you got into what you do, and then talk about why what led to the the writing and the release of this book. Sure, sure. Well, so I have an interesting connection to fertility awareness charting. Um, like many women, I had some issues with my period from my very first one. My periods were really heavy and and uh, they were painful. And I was a teenager, really active in sport, and I was put on the pill as a result. I mean, that was the only thing I knew to do about that. Um, and so I was on the pill before I needed it for birth control. And for a number of reasons, when I actually did need birth control, I decided I was going to come off the pill and use condoms instead, because I grew up in the 90s when they told us that condoms were effective. And it was right around that time that I discovered fertility awareness. So after being taught that I could get pregnant every single day of my cycle, this was the first time I learned that there's actually only a small window of fertility. And I could learn to track my fertile signs, identify that window of fertility and use that for birth control. Or if when I was ready to have babies, I could use that to optimize my chances of conception. So that really changed my outlook on a whole lot of things. I began teaching women in my early 20s. And you know, now about 20 years later, um, I am still talking about it because the average woman still doesn't really understand how her cycle works and how it connects to her overall health. So that's a little bit about how I got into like a super short summary of how I got into what I'm doing now. And so somewhere along the way, I started my podcast, you know, I wrote my first book, The Fifth Vital Sign. And Lily and I, actually, when I was writing The Fifth Vital Sign, she was writing Real Food for Pregnancy. We were book buddies. Uh, we had met via the podcast. She had sent me her first book, Real Food for Gestational Diabetes. And we had this conversation one day and I was trying to convince her to write Real Food for PCOS. And she was like, no, I'm not going to do that. She said, but I want to write this book about pregnancy. So we were book buddies. Uh, we you know, met weekly for a couple of years so that we could get those projects out. And somewhere along the way, I mean, it became very clear that Lily was recommending my book to her clients who were asking for more information about optimizing conception. And all of my fertility clients, uh, I recommend Real Food for Pregnancy. And to the point where when I have clients that are not actively trying to conceive, but looking to optimize their cycles, balance hormones, all of those things, I'm still recommending her book. And I'm like, I know it says Real Food for Pregnancy, but... <laughs> You need to read this book because it has the nutritional foundations that you need to optimize your cycle. So this is really what led us to combine forces and write this book together because it's essentially the book that our you know listeners, readers, fans, clients have been asking for um, unbeknownst to them for years. So, you know, the, the title of the book is Real Food for Fertility. So let's maybe step one, how big of an issue is infertility in this country? And then step two, what role do you think the standard American diet plays in infertility issues? Two softball questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, <laughs> so, I mean, I think that we're all somewhat aware of the fact that there is a growing infertility problem. So when we look at statistics, it, it's looking to be 15%, you know, one in six couples are struggling with fertility challenges. And often we think of fertility challenges as primarily a woman's issue. One of the things we really tackle in the book is that 
20 to 30 percent of the time if a couple is struggling with infertility it's related to male factor as a sole contributing factor and then up to 50 percent of the time which is half it is related somewhat so it's a combination of both so this is an issue that affects both men and women it's kind of worldwide the statistics are really interesting all across the world in terms of these fertility challenges and i mean i think there's a, a variety of factors, but absolutely one of the crucial factors is nutrition. And so when we look at uh, even, it's interesting because I often have this conversation about sperm quality. And so many of your listeners may have heard some of those stats that sperm counts have been declining over the years. And it's really staggering when you look. So I know I'm focusing on men for a second, but I think this helps to answer the question. But it's really staggering when we look at the sperm counts and how much they've declined. So to give an example, the average man in the 40s had a sperm concentration of about, let's say, 113 uh, million sperm per milliliter, which sounds like a whole lot. And the average man today has somewhere around 50 million sperm per milliliter. So as women, we don't have the same ability to provide like an egg sample as men do with a sperm sample. So that gives us a little bit of insight into what's going on. And often I'm asked, you know, what like, why is this happening? Why are our, our men's sperm counts declining? Because this would imply that it's not just an issue with some couples. It would imply that there's some sort of general factor that's affecting, you know, all men and by proxy, all of us, including the women. And so, I mean, we can look at the quality of the diet. Um, I know in, in the book, Lily talks a lot about the work of Dr. Weston A. Price, who traveled the world to try to determine why it was that traditional cultures had better fertility, but also better bone structure and development and things like that versus the so-called industrial nations. And it was really interesting because he would measure the nutritional content of the food, you know, the micronutrient content of the food that they were eating. And he found that these traditional cultures, the density of, of micronutrients in the food was just you know, staggering compared to what we eat today. So if you think about then what were they eating? They were eating ancestral foods. They were eating, you know, organ meats. They were eating fish. They were eating vegetables. They were eating, um, you know, un unprocessed dairy products, but they were eating things that were essentially unprocessed. So we go back to the title of the book, Real Food. So when we think about how that standard diet has changed for the average person today, a lot of what we're consuming is processed or ultra po processed. And you know what that means is if you look at white flour or white sugar or gummy candies, we can't even recognize what it came from. So did it come from a sugar beet? <laughs> did it come from, you know, canola? Like we don't even know what it came from. And when we have this high level of processing in our food, as we know, it really just gets rid of a lot of the nutrients to the point that we have to then artificially, you know, put them back into the food when we fortify them. So yeah, it's a big conversation, but I think that gives us at least some insight into the role that food and, you know, deficiency there is playing in this overall problem of fertility. Yeah, I guess the issue comes down to, is it just nutritional deficiency, right? And somebody could make the argument, well, we put those micronutrients back in, but I think- But do we- like, do well, we really know all of the micronutrients that are in the food? I mean, if we throw in a couple B vitamins, like, are we really matching the composition of whatever, you know, nature had in store? Well, that's the point, right? So <laughs> there's a difference between putting the individual things we can measure and monitor back in and really restoring the same quality and um, functionality of something before it was destroyed and, and degraded and processed. And so, you know, it's like the whole chicken noodle soup story, right? Like we realize that chicken noodle soup has some medicinal benefit to it, right? Cultures have been giving chick real chicken noodle soup, not the yeah. stuff you buy at the grocery store, right? <laughs> but grandmas used to make this on the stove and make this like old school and it helped people get well. And so, pe you know, people in industry said, okay, well, let's rip that thing apart and figure out what component in there is actually making people healthy. And then we'll put it in a capsule form and we'll sell it and make lots of money. And what they found was not any one of the individual ingredients had the same benefit, right? And so then they realized, realized there was either, it was the synergistic quality 
of the chicken noodle soup, or it was something they didn't have the ability to measure and duplicate that had the benefit. And so I think that the same thing we're talking about when we're processing foods, right? We're putting back component, what we measure as components or what we determine is a beneficial thing to put back. And that thing we're putting back may not be as similar to what's real in that whole food thing. And we may be leaving out this, the pieces that really make those individual components. And many times the thing we're putting in is not, is more of a toxic uh, cousin of that micronutrient versus what it really is. Mm-hmm. Does that make, would you agree with it, that? I, I do. And I, I feel like that's, it, that's kind of almost a summary of what we're arguing when we take the real food approach. It doesn't mean that there's no room for supplementation, but in the true definition of the word, you'd be supplementing your diet. And so even um, as you were talking about the chicken noodle soup example, I was thinking about, you know, in um, one of the food or food categories that we highlight in in the book, meat on the bones, slow cooked meat and bone broth. And, you know, Lily breaks down in detail a lot of the, you know, amino acids, nutrition, nutrients, and, and their different you know, the different roles that they play in fertility. So we can kind of look deeply into like why this chicken soup is so beneficial. But to your point, I mean, this is why we take this approach of food, because there are a lot of things that we understand about food and the components in some of these, um, you know, fertility, I, I even hesitate to say fertility foods, but the foods that we are highlighting that are beneficial for fertility. Um, But the thing about it is there's a lot of things within the food that we don't necessarily know about. Mm -hmm. Because we we do know, like when I take a B complex, like my pee turns bright yellow, like neon. Mm -hmm. But when I eat liver (laughs) and, you know, other foods that are, you know, high in these same B vitamins, nothing like that happens because of all of the different cofactors, some that we're aware of and some that we're not aware of, that facilitate optimal absorption of these nutrients. Our body knows what to do with them. They're they're the same language. And, you know, even I'm sure you found as well, you know, to some extent in clinical practice, like when you have uh, clients who are consuming really high micronutrient dense foods and, and really, you know, satisfying that requirement of the body, it, it, you know, in addition to whatever supplements that they're taking, I think you get better results. And I've seen that, in, I've seen that in a number of specific even examples. Like one easy example is iron. You know, uh, a lot of women, especially women who've struggled with painful periods or who've had multiple babies struggle with iron deficiency, which is crucial also for maintaining thyroid function because there's a connection between, you know, having low iron levels and, and suboptimal thyroid function. And so, um, I've seen it where you can take iron pills for years and it doesn't necessarily get your levels in line the way that eating liver does. Um, and liver we know has, you know, vitamin A and other nutrients that help us to absorb the iron um, differently. And also what's interesting, <laughs> but I don't have the exact name on YouTube, but I've I've seen these videos where they'll take processed cereal that is fortified with iron and they'll grind it into a paste and put it in, like I've, I, I saw this thing where they put it in a plastic bag and they used an, a magnet and then like they show you that it's like inorganic like mm-hmm. iron like iron filings so our, so that's a really crude example but the when we fortify foods sometimes the the component that we're putting in there is not even as absorbable or usable by our bodies which could indicate why we do often better at least in some cases with the food base versus the supplement version yeah i i i think it's a big challenge today that we we have so many people just reaching for supplementation and like i need bees vitamin i need this i need that i need you know right now there's a p- big push for everybody to be taking these amino acid powders and i'm like wait a minute <laughs> you really need collagen powder and amino acid powders do you eat protein maybe you need to eat more protein and break down your proteins maybe you need to support digestion before you start buying all these powders but they're beneficial the, these people are talking about you need to eat collagen okay do you eat ground do you eat ground meat yeah. Okay. Guess what? Guess what's all in there? It's all the, that, all, there's a ton of collagen in there, right? Do you, so that you can get all of the stuff we need by eating more whole face foods. And then before you, maybe we jump to supplementation, we should be thinking, maybe I need to make sure I'm eating healthy food, digesting healthy food before I start throwing excessive foods and excipients into our, 
into the gut, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and this is essentially the approach, you know, this is, um, I just think it's it's a, a really lovely kind of mix of, of things for uh, for those who are really wanting to support their fertility in a more natural way, where if we lay down the foundation of nutrition, and what's interesting as well in, in the book is that we break down the importance of uh, achieving both optimal macro and micronutrient balance. So, you know, particularly for women, we focus on the importance of consuming a sufficient amount of protein, not, you know, shying away from eating adequate fat, as well as high quality carbohydrates as the first and foremost kind of foundational piece, because it's really common for women to unintentionally under eat protein, and that has a really negative impact on hormones. So I think it's interesting to say these things. But what we tried to do in the book is to also kind of show you what the research has to say about what happens to our hormones when women under eat these macronutrients, and also the importance of maintaining blood sugar balance. Because when you're, you know, under consuming protein and fat, you end up consuming a ton of carbs, which gives you sufficient calories in many cases, but it doesn't give you the foundational optimal building blocks to achieve optimal hormone balance. But in addition to focusing on getting sufficient macros, and I would say particularly for, you know, for all women, period, full stop, but, you know, especially women who are really active, uh, because what I always say is that with for men, let's go into gender stereotypes for a minute. <laughs> um, men generally are trying to bulk up when they work out. So it's not uncommon for men to then, you know, take the protein powders and, and whatever they want to do uh, or eat extra meals because they're trying to bulk up their bodies. Whereas women, stereotypically, we tend to want to slim out and thin out. And so this is a an issue that we can really see clearly when we're looking at the menstrual cycle, when we're tracking whether it's, you know, the overall cycle length or we're breaking down the cycle into the pre and post ovulatory phases, especially the post ovulatory phase. It's very sensitive to under eating, under nutrition. If you're working out a lot and not getting enough food, we're, you know, typically see things like a shorter luteal phase or, you know, even premenstrual spotting or increased PMS. So one of the great things about tracking your cycle when you get into kind of my world is that you can actually see the real time effect of what you're doing. Um, but like I said, women tend to under eat because we're often looking to thin up our bodies and we don't necessarily know the impact that that could have on our hormone health or our fertility. So let me back you up a little bit because that was a lot of information but i want to <laughs> kind of get through some of this stuff and and uh make sure we we, we kind of stay in on a path here when we're talking about real food for fertility right what were is there we're talking about a whole food based diet as a general concept and this is this really doesn't matter whether you're trying to become more fertile or not, these are the foundational concepts that everybody should um, consider as a starting point, my opinion. You should be a, 85, 80, 85% of the time, you should be eating a whole food-based diet and you're probably going to be healthier regardless of what you're trying to accomplish, right? Mm -hmm. um, and but, Lily defines real food in the book. So if you want, I could share a little bit about how she defines it. Sure. Um, so what, is that, what does that mean, a real food-based diet? Well, so how we define it, real food is as close to its source as possible and has been grown or raised in conditions that maximize nutrient density. So think, you know, fresh vegetables that are actually in season, you know, and not like canned or frozen or those kinds of things like shortly after being harvested and also like as close to natural as possible. So ideally, you know, low in pesticides, those types of things, minimally processed, similar to how you would find it in nature. And even if we are using foods that are coming in packages and things like that, we can still recognize where it came from. Um, so she also goes on to say, real food often doesn't have a label, but when it does, it's made with simple ingredients and no additives. So I think that, that even just that basic guideline, it seems like, why should we have to define it? But it's helpful to define it so we can know exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, so real, I mean, Real food typically doesn't have a, much of a label, right? It is, it's a piece of meat. It's a burger, right? It True. doesn't have its- But in our modern world, sometimes, right? So, so we're kind of, we're not being such purists that we want it to, to be impossible for our, our, our readers to kind of follow, but we also are being very clear that it's food that we recognize as close as possible to its natural form. And I think one other piece that's really important is that 
when we look at certain categories of food, like dairy, for example, in its most natural form, it still contains the fat. When we look at meat, for example, when we get different cuts of meat, it naturally contains the fat, the collagen, especially if we're looking at, you know, that meat on the bone and things like that. So we're also kind of even taking it a step further to say that we're not like getting rid of the fat. We're not getting rid of, you know, these different components. We're using well, it as it would appear in nature. Yeah, that's a whole nother conversation, right? Because we went through that phase. I think that was the 90s phase where fat is bad and you can't eat fat. And I want to talk to you about each of these individual macros and the benefit that they have towards fertility. So foundationally, the real food for fertility was we're saying, hey, we want to eat real food. You should eat it as close to the way it walked the earth, swam the ocean, came off the tree or out of the ground, right? And as, as nutritionally dense soil versus maybe big factory farming where those foods have a tendency to be less nutrient dense. Funny, I just saw something where they were complaining that the biggest threat to the, uh, one of the biggest threats to the environment is is uh, person, people's personal gardens, that somehow oh, yeah. that was more destructive. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure where I saw it, but when I saw it, I was like, you, you, how, you gotta be kidding me. They're gonna try and, that, that, that somebody's gonna try and pull that over. Like I thought yeah, it was those like- those carrots uh, I grew in the backyard, like those uh, are really gonna bring down the whole environmental system. <laughs> I thought maybe it was like a Babylon Bee, like, like thing where they were like, but it wasn't, I went and checked it. I was like, and then I lost where it was, but you know, we, we're, we are, we're spoon fed sometimes this nonsense that these processed foods like this beyond burger this this meat that we grew in a lab is somehow going to be uh healthier more nutritionally dense than something that really comes uh from nature and i just at this point i'm not buying it right i just not but when we think about that so for the person who's now saying hey what we're, we're we want to be thinking about fertility here we're talking about real food for both mom and dad, right? Because both people need to be considering how they're, what they're bringing to the table. Are there things that for the people who are trying to have a child, even within that real food realm, that they really should make sure they're getting more of than somebody in maybe just a general health perspective? I mean, I, I think so, um, because so we could argue that it's still like for general health, I think there's an argument to be made that you still should be focusing on these nutrients. But I do think that it does make sense that at that stage of your life where you're focusing on building a, a human being, which is the most nutrient, um, the, the, the thing that you're doing that requires the most nutrients versus anything else, you know, as a, as a mother who's had three children. So at the, at the time we're recording this, I have an 11 year old, an eight year old, and an 18 month old. So I've been through this three times, and there really isn't anything comparable to the nutrient draw on your body from growing humans and then breastfeeding them, you know, for multiple years. So I think there is an argument to be made for um, having a specific preconception period of time for both mom and dad. Uh, when when you have the you know when you know that you're planning ahead, so when you have the luxury of of planning that. Because um, especially from, so it's important for both parties. It's important for men because that's how we really optimize his fertility as well. And there are, um, we go into some research, there are a number of specific outcomes, even on the, you know, the mother's side or the baby's side that are directly related to the quality of his sperm. So Lily uncovered some interesting research that even placental development is expressed mostly from his contribution. So if your partner has poor semen and sperm quality, then that could lead to issues with the placental development, which could then lead to poor birth outcomes. And it's not even like it's related to him. So that is important as well. But for the mom, especially, what I always say is that even if you are really well nourished and you go through pregnancy, you know, even keel, you still are going to have challenges as a mother. So it's so much more challenging if you're starting motherhood nutrient deplete. If it, and most women aren't necessarily going into pregnancy or coming out the other side optimal. Like there's no scenario where you're going to come out the other side after pregnancy and breastfeeding and have more nutrient nutrients than you did going in. Um, yeah. So so that that piece of it definitely. I mean, we um, in the book 
uh, we go through certain specific foods that we recommend. So we obviously start with the real food umbrella, as we talked about, but a couple of foods that we encourage, um, especially for fertility, include eggs, liver and organ meats, as I had mentioned, meat on the bone, so kind of the bone broth, but meat on the bone, especially, you know, slow cooked meat for the just slew of nutrients, amino acids, you know, glycine, collagen, there's a, a number of different nutrients, especially found in those cuts of meat, fatty fish and seafood. I mean, especially when we're looking at optimizing egg quality and sperm quality, uh, we certainly see this correlation between omega-3 fatty acid consumption and optimizing our egg and sperm quality. So there's a lot to be said about that. Um, minimally processed full-fat dairy products. We talk about the importance of um, of fat in general as a concept. And in particular, there's a number of food studies that find a link between better fertility, better ovulatory function in women specifically who are eating full-fat dairy products. So it was almost like an inconvenient finding for the researchers who didn't expect to see that. Um, and you can see that in terms of how they respond to it and how they talk about it in their studies. Uh, we also talk about fermented foods, of course, fruits and vegetables. You know, there's a number of different foods that we talk about prioritizing. And it's really interesting because when it comes to sperm quality, there is a lot to be said for fresh fruit, fre fresh vegetables, antioxidants, and even citrus fruits and, you know, dark colored fruits and berries. Like there's a number of studies that that really show that correlation, particularly when those foods are pesticide free. So that's kind of like a overview. I think these foods can help everybody. Um, but really, the the benefit for these particular foods that we're highlighting, um, in addition to just getting good macronutrient ratios, is the high micronutrient density of these particular foods and they, their composition, um, which is specifically the, the nutrients that we need to optimize our fertility. So I think if we look at, at people, generally, their diet overall, high in processed foods, high in processed carbohydrate foods. Um, and when you start to talk to women, men as well, but you know, women, especially as they're planning into a pregnancy, I, I think what women have a tendency to under protein and under fat. And I think we've kind of drilled women. I think, think of that. Um, you often hear like, wow, I'm not, you know, I'm not graining a bunch of muscle. Like you kind of said, I don't need all this protein. Um, but it's critical as a building block. And then they're afraid of fat, dietary fat, because they think it's going to lead to fat, be, becoming fat. But we often talk on the podcast, like the protein and fats that we consume are ultimately the building blocks of this person that you're going to develop, right? They're the building blocks of our cells, our tissues, our enzymes, our neurotransmitters. So what I yeah, what I want you to talk about is why women shouldn't be afraid of these things, why they are so important. Carbohydrates are important as well, but carbohydrates are the one thing that's really more energy. Fats and fat fats and carbs are both energy sources, but fats are also a building block. Protein, key building block, can be used as an energy source. But what's the conversation for especially for women as to getting their protein levels up and their fat intake up, healthy fats intake up, and what should those things look like? Mm -hmm. from, well, such a great a question. Mm -hmm. I think um, from my perspective, uh, with the work that I do with women relating to menstrual cycle function, there's a bit of an easy in for me in this conversation because we can see in real time what happens when you undereat overall and specifically when you undereat protein. Um, so what I mean by that is that when I'm working with you know clients who are struggling with hormonal imbalances or a variety of menstrual cycle complaints and we look at their overall you know dietary intake, there's a very clear link between undereating specifically protein and having a difficult time making hormones. I mean, when you're not getting enough food, but specifically, and, you know, oftentimes it goes hand in hand. Oftentimes we're not getting enough food, but the protein intake in particular and potentially the fat intake is also very, very low. 
And what we see in cases like that on the menstrual cycle chart, for example, is low basal body temperatures. It's pretty common. And it's interesting because when I first went into this work, I was, you know, I came out of my training thinking that it was the thyroid solely that caused these problems. But what I discovered is that it's all connected. So when I see a client who has really low basal body temperatures, you know, lower than what they normally should be. And for anyone who isn't that familiar, you know, with menstrual cycle charting, we're looking at, you know, the basal body temperature, which is you know, when you take your temperature first thing in the morning before you've gotten out of bed, it gives you this measure of metabolism. We're looking at cervical fluid charting and we're looking at a few other signs as well. Um, but when you're looking at a menstrual cycle chart for someone who's in the midst of it, this is front and center. We're seeing their daily temperature uh, taking. And so when a woman is under eating protein, that's one of the first things that we see, uh, you know, happen. And obviously that means that it's affecting overall metabolism, affecting thyroid function to some degree because we're seeing these consistently low temperatures. Um, another thing that is really common that we see, as I had mentioned earlier, is these issues in the luteal phase. And I think those ones are easier to see because in a healthy menstrual cycle, after a woman ovulates, we would expect for her period to start about 12 to 14 days after ovulation. And in that scenario, um, you know, in an optimal cycle, we're not expecting to see a lot of premenstrual spotting. And although it's common for women to have difference in changes in their mood and things like that, we don't expect to have raging PMS. And so what's really consistent, common in these situations is that these women have shorter luteal phases, or they have a lot of spotting, or they have other signs of low progesterone. And when we improve and increase their protein intake to what it needs to be, um, then it, it's much improved. Um, and so that's kind of the first, like, I think from a practical standpoint to one of the advantages I think that I have with clients is that we are taking it out of the theoretical realm and they're seeing it directly. They're seeing those impacts directly. When you're seeing these issues in the menstrual cycle chart um, and, <laughs> and you're kind of like wanting to, to improve them, it's kind of an easy layup to add sufficient protein, you know, really improve the macronutrient ratio, starting with breakfast, usually we focus on um, to see those changes quickly. And what's interesting is that you can see that shift within a few weeks, if not a few days, um, certainly within one uh, cycle. And one of the things I want to share as well is that this was a trend that I've seen quite a bit. You know, I've seen this over the years and I found this really interesting study that looked at, so it was one of those controlled feeding studies where they actually had the participants eat a specific amount. And so they had one group of women who were consuming um adequate calories for their energy levels. So they had them in a, on a eucaloric diet and they had another group who was exercising a bit, but specifically consuming about 20 to 30% lower overall calories, which obviously means that they were also eating lower protein. And in that particular group, what was really, this is the part that I find really interesting, uh, maybe just because I'm a data nerd, but the menstrual cycle overall, um, like the overall cycle length wasn't necessarily changed a whole lot. So it wasn't that the whole menstrual cycle had changed and they were still ovulating. But when they measured the estrogen and progesterone levels of these women, they were significantly lower. So even though the cycle itself wasn't necessarily that different, we saw this profound decrease in overall hormone levels. So what I often would see on the menstrual chart in, th in situations like that is lower cervical fluid production, you know, potentially some of that spotting and other signs or even the increase in PMS symptoms. And so this study was really kind of showing that this there's a direct correlation between what we're consuming and our overall hormone levels. Yeah, I think well, I think that's really important because a lot of people would think, hey, if I'm if my my body temperature's down, right? It's a thyroid issue. If my hormones are down, I just need more hormones. And in reality, this is where, hey, if maybe if I'm not getting sufficient amount of building block into my diet and protein, which can be converted into amino acids, which then get in and can be used as building blocks, maybe one of the reasons why you do have decreased tissue thyroid status is because there aren't enough building blocks to maintain a higher state of metabolism in that cell. So how do we slow down the metabolism and reduce the T4 to T3 conversion so that we don't rev up a system that doesn't have the resources for it. I mean, we see this from a mitochondrial standpoint. So I think that's really important because I think in that situation, so many people would say, I just need more thyroid hormone and might falsely be put on 
uh, or inappropriately be put on thyroid medication when they don't need it. And I, I, I really think there are a huge amount of people, and there's some literature that's out there that's saying maybe 60 to 90% of the people put on thyroid medication are put on it inappropriately, too early, too soon for symptoms or a, or a, that one value that's out of range or slightly out of the range. And somebody says, well, I'll just give it to you. And we don't realize the negative impact that that can have. So I think it's really important that when we think about, hey, I'm, you know, something like that. I have abnormal cycles. I do, oh, and my estrogen's low. Let me just give more estrogen. No, it might be something as simple and as foundational as you're not getting enough calories. You're not getting appropriate macros. And that's foundational. Your book, mm-hmm. my book, we talk about the same foundational things. Hey, we, these are things, these are non-negotiables, yeah. <laughs> right? If you want to be healthy, these are non-negotiable, right? So when you're thinking about somebody heading into pregnancy, where there's, there's lots of opinions about what protein intake should be, um, how, what the, how do you figure out or where do you see the protein fat carb macro ratio should be and does that change pre for t- pre pregnancy right pregnancy and then through each trimester well so i will start by saying that lily is a resident nutritionist and so she could speak a lot more specifically to the differences because of course her first book real food for pregnancy she's specifically getting into what the requirements are for pregnancy, how her recommendations sometimes differ from the guidelines and why. Um, So, I mean, I can provide you with uh, some information, but I think just, I think you should have Lily on the show actually potentially to make that suggestion on air um, because she gets really into more of the specifics into that specific question. Um, But something I wanted to say that I think is really interesting that uh, Lily uncovered in one of her chapters is that protein intake directly affects thermogenesis. Like I thought this was really interesting. So of all the macronutrients, the one that's going to improve your body temperature and kind of normalize and stabilize that temperature is protein in particular. And one of the things that she really calls out is the discrepancy between the kind of recommended daily allowance as far as protein goes, protein requirements for women versus what has found to actually be optimal, especially in athletes. And so um, she uh, goes on to say that, you know, the the recommended dietary allowance based on body weight, um, like if a woman's about 150 pounds, that equates to about 55 grams of protein. But what we've, you know, what the research shows would be more optimal for kind of a woman of that average size falls more of a minimum of 80 to 100 grams of protein versus, you know, someone who's actually athletic at that weight, who might even need to go as high as 120, 150, or even 175. So depending on their activity level. So I, you know, to give that kind of example, the overall point of what I'm saying is that what the recommended amounts of protein and the requirements that are often kind of put out there, they have a different goal in mind versus when we're looking to optimize fertility, optimize menstrual cycle health, balance hormone health, especially in active women. And so generally speaking, um, what I've observed just, you know, day to day is the average woman just is under eating protein. In terms of macronutrient uh, ratios, one of the easy ways that uh, Lily talks about kind of optimizing that is by the plate method. So looking at the the way that we structure our food on the plate, instead of having, so I'm a West Indian girl. So so my plate method growing up was like half rice or like three quarters rice, right? And then a little bit of meat and a little bit of vegetables. And so we're looking even if, even if all you do after listening to this episode is re-engineer your plate so that instead of having half the plate of your kind of starchy carbohydrate, like the potatoes and the rice, you put that to a quarter of the plate, vegetables with, you know, sauteed in some fat so that we're getting sufficient amount of fat, half the plate and our protein source to be the quarter of the plate. If, if that's all you take from today's episode, then you will have already been well on your way to optimizing your macronutrient ratio compared to what we were doing before. Yeah. I, I think most people are, are protein deficient. Uh, when you really 
And most people would say they eat, they eat plenty. But when you really ask them to kind of chart out a couple of days and get a look at what they're consuming, I think most people are shocked by yeah. <laughs> how much carbohydrate. Um, and some of them are high carb, high fat, which is problematic and low protein. And sim- sometimes just simple shifts and, you know, increasing the protein, dropping the carbohydrate load creates a huge change in how they feel, how they function, their cravings. And I typically will recommend a sliding scale. And we I do a little bit more of a calculation. So somewhere between 0.7 to maybe 1.0 grams of protein per pound of ideal body weight, depending on their physical activity level. Um, and so that kind of gives us a ballpark, but, you know, somewhere in that, you know, you know, if you needed, like, if somebody said, well, what should, uh, just as a rough number, I think probably closer, the vast majority of people probably closer to about 40% of their macros protein, which is a lot, maybe, I think the old number was like 30, maybe 30%. I think most people need to be a little bit higher than they give consideration, but it does differ based on your activity level, your exercise level, that it does, that does play a role. Um, and I think the reason that becomes so important is those fats, I mean, those proteins are the building blocks of everything that's going to come. And the fats are critically important um, building blocks as well. And if you don't have those things, you're not going to be healthy. You're not going to have optimal hormones. You're definitely going to put your developing child into um, a process of potential poor development just because you don't well, have the building block for them to make the tissues absolutely. and neurotransmitters and the hormones that they need. Well, when we take it to fertility, um, there's there are these correlations we can look at in the research. So when you're not consuming sufficient protein and fat, so like you said, protein is an essential building block for our hormones and for obviously our our, our babies, but also it's crucial for egg quality as well. Um, fats, especially saturated fats, uh, you know, cholesterol is the founding, you know, it's, it's it's the precursor for all of our steroid hormones, including estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And so uh, what's interesting is that when we look at a woman's hormone levels, if we're looking at her, you know, estrogen levels and her preovulatory phase, there's a correlation between her estrogen levels and the quality of her, you know, egg and follicular development in that cycle. And so there's this direct relationship between what you're eating, your macro ratio, getting sufficient protein, um, sufficient fat, and we still, we do need carbohydrates. We just want to optimize our consumption of those. And often we can just naturally crowd out some of the suboptimal carbohydrate consumption by consuming sufficient protein. But when you're consuming, a, you know, an optimal amount, like we're talking about, that correlates with better follicular development. And so when you have optimal follicular development, you know, that follicle, which holds the egg in our ovaries, develops to a really good size, and we have a really good, strong, good quality egg, that corresponds to better ovarian hormone production. And it also uh, corresponds to, you know, luteal phase hormone production as well. So all of these things are directly related even to the quality of the egg. And there were some interesting animal studies that showed that, you know, if we're not feeding, um, so I know we're not uh, animals, but there were some interesting studies that found this link between under eating and then having suboptimal follicular development. So the egg doesn't even get to the, the optimal size. And that, all, you know, is also corresponding to that hormone development. So if even just from that foundational piece of what do we need to do to have good egg quality. So often it's really popular to jump straight to the supplements, which we also talk about. But before we even get to the supplements, we have to have the nutrition dialed in so that we have the building block and foundation so that the eggs are, you know, developing to the best of their possible ability before we even get to the the um, supplement conversation. So when we're talking about the eggs, right, we talk about the maturity of the eggs and there's there's a discussion about how diet, how inflammation, how blood sugar can potentially have a role in changing the ability of the eggs to develop appropriately, right? Um, we have this, we call this thing, one of those conditions, polycystic ovary syndrome, right? So can you explain to people, you're kind of on that topic, so we might as well get into it, what's happening at the ovary with 
the eggs, their development, how does or how could uh, uh, our diet influence how well those eggs, uh, their ability to mature appropriately? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. There was a really a, a large scale study that did find that women who had the highest rate or highest intake of refined carbohydrates were at a 78% greater risk of ovulatory infertility compared to women who had normal, you know, regular uh, carbohydrate intake. So right off the bat, we can see this link between the highest consumption of you know, refined carbohydrates and impairing ovul ovulatory function. And so in the case of PCOS, um, PCOS is, is characterized by inflammation. It's characterized by insulin resistant, especially in terms of classic PCOS. And what you have happening in a scenario like that is when you are dealing with uh, insulin resistant PCOS, you're having women who are consuming their potentially refined carbohydrates and what is supposed to happen is our body is supposed to produce insulin. Our receptors are supposed to respond to it. And that is supposed to allow our bodies to remove that sugar from our bloodstream and keep everything stable. So in the case of you know insulin-resistant PCOS, we have this influx of carbohydrate, which is raising our blood sugar. And then our body's making insulin, putting it out there, but our cells are not responding to it. And so then in order, it's like this fire is going and we're putting it out on this water, but the fire isn't responding to the water. And so we end up having to put more. So your body ends up having to make more insulin in order to get the job done. And, and that process causes uh, or leads to greater amounts of inflammation. And what's happening essentially is that the ovaries then, all of this, you know, all of these things that are happening are desensitizing the ovaries to that follicle stimulating hormone. So instead of you just ovulating, you know, when you're supposed to after that normal follicular development, you end up having a situation where the ovaries are producing a number of small follicles. And if you were to picture like a little bag of marbles, that's kind of this idea of the polycystic ovary, where you have a number of small immature follicles, and none of which are actually getting to the, the true follicular development stage in a timely manner. And it's because the insulin resistance, the inflammation, and these other factors are interfering with this ovulatory process. So what's interesting is that, you know, women with PCOS, this is a specific, you know, metabolic issue that these women are predisposed to. So in their case, there's more of an overt response to this excessive carbohydrate consumption. Like their body is just not able to um, to process it properly. And so for these women who have insulin resistant PCOS, you know, often they're seeing really dramatic improvements in ovulatory function when they get their macronutrient ratio in balance. So by adding, you know, additional protein, consuming sufficient fat, reducing their consumption of the, you know, processed or refined carbohydrates and really looking to optimize their carbohydrate intake for items that are less likely to raise blood sugar, they're seeing a really, you know, positive improvement there. So many women in this situation can see a significant improvement in their ovulatory function just by shifting diet, um, though they may require additional supplementation to further sensitize their body to insulin. But what's interesting so about that, I just want to just throw in there that this, to some degree, impacts all women. So it's in, it's beneficial for all women to aim for a macronutrient, you know, balance, and to so it's not just women with PCOS that are negatively impacted by high refined carbohydrate consumption. It might not be as overt in terms of the degree to which it could d disrupt ovulation, um, but it is important, I think, for all women to be aware of, you know, balancing their blood sugar and things of that nature. Yeah, I, I think one of the challenges with the conversation here is is that we talk about insulin like insulin's the bad guy. Yeah, it's the good guy. <laughs> and, and insulin's actually the good guy. So we talk about insulin resistance, like, you, you know, I, you know, I hear people say all the time, you got to get your insulin under control, your insulin. Like the insulin is there to try and help, right? Yes. The cells are resistant to insulin or, and res, I, probably the better thing is resistant to glucose for a reason, right? Yeah. Um, and so is it that I just consume too much carbohydrate? Maybe. Maybe that's the case, right? 
But well, there's think- some research to suggest that part of the there's there's cases where those receptor sites, them not responding to insulin could be related to toxin exposure because, you know, those who have insulin resistance um, are like this was some really interesting research. I remember years ago, I attended this conference and Dr. Joseph Pizzorno presented this information about diabetes, and he was sharing this link between high toxicity and potentially impairing the ability of our um, receptor sites to uh, to be sensitive to insulin. So I think there, that's not the only factor, absolutely. Oh, but no, I think I, it's interesting to look at, like why why are why does our body not respond? Like in these cases, why why are those receptor sites not responding to the insulin? Yeah. I, listen, I, I think it's exactly the point I make in, in, in my book, The Thyroid Debacle, is that when we're talking about glucose resistance, we have to we have to consider why would the cell become glucose resistant? We say, oh, because the cell is full of glucose because we don't exercise and we don't, we're not active and we're not using it. But now we're talking about an ovary, right? Yeah. So uh, like, wait a minute, we're not necessarily putting that ovary through an exercise where it depletes. So why would that, why would that ovary not be receptive to glucose. Well, uh, probably we've got some type of a cell stress response, right? We've got some type of immune inflammatory response. Is it toxin? Is it infection? Is it organisms? Is it decreased T4 to T3 conversion as part of the process? Is it emotional stress that's causing a a, a signaling mechanism? So I, I think the glucose resistance issue is less a factor of just eating too much glucose. I, I think it's yes. that's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but it's it's more complex than that. And I would argue that probably for the people who are changing their glucose, their diet, and redu- consuming less processed carbohydrate and eating cleaner foods, um, the issue is probably you're removing a lot of the toxicity of those highly processed foods, and that may have the bigger impact on the glucose signaling than just the excessive load. Because if we think about how metabolism is designed to work, when we consume more calories than we need, more glucose than we need, the body starts to store those calories. And when we start to store those calories, then we send signals to the brain, leptin, goes to the brain, says, hey, that's enough. And by the way, we're going to use that leptin to increase the conversion of T4 to T3 to increase the metabolism. We're going to signal satiety and we're going to upregulate the metabolism of the body in general to burn off those reserves. That's how the skinny person who eats a lot of calories, doesn't exercise, maintains their body weight for the most part. Their metabolism works really well. But I think when we're looking at women men in two, but men don't have ovaries, contrary to popular (laughs) belief, right? But when we think about what's going on here, we have to say, if this woman is having glucose signaling issues, there is some type of threat response that those tissues are potentially sensing, right? Systemic inflammation, bacteria, organisms, and and that tissue is resistant to glucose, yes, because of that cell stress response. And part of that may be the reason why it's resistant or not taking that that FSH signal at the receptor either is because like, hey, we got a threat response here. We are not maturing an an egg so that we can have a child. We've got bigger issues going on. And so I think that probably lends to the issue versus, you just eat too much carbohydrates because I have plenty of women who come in. They're like, they told me I have PCOS. Okay, well, let's talk about your diet, your nutrition. Well, there's a lot of women who are told that they have PCOS that arguably don't meet the requirement. So that's that's a whole other issue that I have. Like, it's something I take issue with where um, any woman who has any issue with, with her menstrual cycle or ovulation or anything like that is told that she has PCOS often without um the proper information. So I think that um, there, there is this, there seems to be this, this difference, you know, in, in the metabolic health of a, a woman who is predisposed to PCOS versus women who, who don't have it. So it's not that every single woman who eats a lot of carbohydrates is going to have delayed ovulation, like you're absolutely right. But there are, there are a subset of women who do have this response in their body when they do overconsume carbohydrates. 
and it, it would be interesting to to kind of determine more of the nuance as to to why that's happening. But for those women who meet those that definition of classic PCOS um, or insulin resistant PCOS. I think that there has to be like a multi-pronged approach, but many of these women do respond quite well to balancing those macronutrients. Um, but I think to your point, there's plenty of women who eat all the carbohydrates and don't, it doesn't disrupt ovulatory function. So it is really interesting, the question to say, well, why is it that some women have this issue and meet this definition of PCOS while others who are engaging in arguably the same type of diet <laughs> don't respond the same way? Yeah, and I, I think that comes down to cell signaling, and what are the, what's the rest of the load going on for that that person? Obviously, genetics can play a role in the process. I think genes get we blame genes when we don't know what else to blame, but um, I think there's a lot of um, immune inflammatory processes that are going on in people, and we're just not aware. Uh, well, you and eyes of the world may be aware that hey, <laughs> yeah. this is a chronic issue when 60% of the, of the U.S. population is overweight or obese, right? 60% of the population has blood glucose issues. 60% of the population or 50% of the adult population is on, a, on statin medications. We've got a chronic immune inflammatory process going on in the vast majority of people. Some at higher grade, some are lower grade. And that what's driving that physical stress, chemical stress, emotional stress, dietary stress, toxins, organisms, sets the stage for cellular sensitivity to micronutrients, mm -hmm. to glucose, to thyroid, thyroid hormone. And so I think there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle, but I think we, we really have to be careful sometimes when how we label, like, oh, it's because you have PCOS. Okay, wait a second. Yeah. A, the, you just slap that label on there. Have you looked at my diet? Have you looked at my lifestyle? Have you looked at my labs? Have you looked at these things? No, this is what we call PCOS. Well, that's the thing we call it, but what's driving it? And the thing that may be driving the PTOS in one person might be different than the next, maybe different from the next, different than the next. The foundational thing is the same. There's some type of cell stress response going on, but it could be driven by a different load in, in all of those people. Mm -hmm. Well, and I mean, PCOS is is a huge topic. I mean, I have a, a short section in the PCOS chapter where I share some research on, in terms of how long it takes women to get a correct diagnosis and practitioners and their level, varying levels of knowledge on the topic, how many women are given an incorrect diagnosis or not diagnosed when they actually truly have it. So I think with, with PCOS, and especially when we're looking at fertility for a woman who's actively trying to conceive, I mean, what she's trying to do is she's trying to figure out how to make her body ovulate <laughs> in a normal you know fashion because one of the classic features of PCOS for you know and the way I word it is for a woman with quote uncontrolled PCOS where we haven't sorted it out yet and her cycles are over the normal range so you know I've seen clients whose cycles range from you know 45 days to 60 or even 90 days 90 days between periods like if you're trying to conceive and you only only ovulate once every you know 60 90 days that makes it so that, you know, if you had a normal healthy menstrual cycle and you were ovulating on average, you know, you know, a day somewhere between days 10 and 22 is what I say within a normal cycle. So if your cycles are an average of about 29 days in a year, you have about 12 chances, you know, to, to try to conceive. Whereas if your cycles are 60 days or 90 days, I mean, that's, you know, maybe six times or four times in a whole year where you're going to ovulate and you have a chance to conceive. So for women who have PCOS, like truly have it, who meet the diagnostic criteria, you know, these women um, really deserve to have the full information and the variety, kind of access to understanding the, the variety of factors that could be contributing. So for women with classic PCOS, where it's more insulin resistant, they do benefit from a combined approach. It's not to say just cut out carbohydrates and then everything will be great. Um, but they do need to, you know, from our perspective, what we're trying to do is educate them on the importance of balancing blood sugar as kind of a first step. And then there's a number of other steps that we can take to optimize overall metabolic health. And it's not just about cutting carbs because it's also about optimizing nutrition. There's a number of deficiencies that are very common in women with PCOS, you know, namely vitamin D and um, 
magnesium, and often even iodine and a variety of other nutrients. And so there's a number of things that for the women who are actively trying to conceive uh, that they need to be aware of. And one of the unfortunate realities for many women with PCOS, especially those who present overweight. So first of all, it's a myth that all women with PCOS are overweight. Um, there's a term in literature, lean PCOS. So uh, from the menstrual cycle standpoint, I don't look at weight at all because it's whether you meet that criteria. And like I said, one of the criteria for PCOS for the diagnosis is having these long, irregular cycles. So regardless of a person's weight, they could still have this metabolic issue. But for, you know, in, you know, many practitioners, uh, many kind of traditional providers will think that the weight is a big piece of this. And so if a woman comes in and they have cycle irregularities and they're presenting as overweight, even just last week, I had um, a client tell me that that they were just told to lose weight. <laughs> like that's the whole solution, like just lose weight and then you'll right. be able to get pregnant. So um, so PCOS, like I said, it's a, it's a big topic and women who are struggling with this issue um, really deserve to have more complete and full information and support in order to really address those underlying factors to support the restoration of their normal ovulation. And the, the, the thing for anyone who's listening who might have PCOS or have been told that they have PCOS and told that they won't be able to get pregnant or whatever they're being told, is that many women with PCOS are able to restore normal ovulatory function, you know, without drugs, if they're willing to kind of do the combination of the dietary approach, correcting nutrient deficiencies, and really optimizing their metabolic state. So you brought up vitamin D. So because you're talking about these people, they're typically overweight, they have low vitamin D. When you're looking Some. at those studies, when you're looking at those studies that say that the vitamin D deficiency may be an issue, what are they looking at? Are they looking at traditional 25 OHD in these people, or are they looking at the activated form of, of vitamin D, which is 125 vitamin D? Do you, do you know? So, what the studies that we're like with that we're referring to in that particular section is when they're looking at women who meet this criteria of PCOS, they're identifying that anywhere from 67 to 85 percent of them are deficient in vitamin D, and that would be the D3. And so it's not there, it's a different kind of study where they're looking at the population and then they're testing their levels and determining that the vast, vast majority are deficient. What's also interesting is that generally in the literature, when we're looking at the relationship between vitamin D and ovulatory function, women who are deficient in vitamin D are much more likely to have ovulatory disturbances, irregular ovulation, and things like that. So there's a really interesting link in the literature between um, you know, vitamin D levels and optimal ovulatory function. So I think there's a problem, though, when we look at those studies. And they're looking at, they're saying vitamin D, but they're looking at 25 OHD. And there's a problem with that. 25 OHD is not the activated form of vitamin D. It is the precursor to active form. For vitamin D to work, it needs to be converted to the 125 vitamin D form, which you rarely see any of these researchers look at. And so my issue with the science that comes up like that is, how do you know that they're truly vitamin D deficient, especially in an overweight person? Because what we do know from the literature is that when people are overweight, their vitamin D and their 25 vitamin D goes into the fat cells. And it was generally thought that it was just stored there. But newer literature shows that, hey, that vitamin D is activated in those fat cells. And what that activated vitamin D does is, one, it has an anti-inflammatory effect. But two, maybe even more important, is that vitamin D increases, and it's this part's argued, whether it increases the size of the fat cells or it increases the number of the fat cells so that we can actually store more calories. And so I think you some think of the- that I have a question because this is really interesting because I, I find it interesting also that women with PCOS tend to be more likely to be deficient in magnesium. And with vitamin D absorption and optimization, my understanding is that, you know, it's best to take vitamin D with some of these cofactors like magnesium or like vitamin A um, to ensure or even vitamin K2 to ensure that it's optimized in the body. And I have seen that some women who kind of meet this definition of low vitamin D will take vitamin D, but it's like their levels won't increase. And this could be exactly what you're referring to. So do you think it, it's it's also relevant that these women are also deficient in some of these cofactors that could then therefore improve the availability of the vitamin D that they already 
have yes and, on board? Yes and no. I think what happens in people is that you need magnesium for every aspect of vitamin D physiology, right? To get vitamin D to the liver, you need magnesium. For the, for the binding globulins to carry vitamin D, you need magnesium. To convert vitamin D to 25 vitamin D, you need magnesium. To activate vitamin D from 25 to 125, you need magnesium. To deactivate vitamin D, you need magnesium. So you can definitely chew up a bunch of magnesium if you are pounding the body with vitamin D. Um, the second piece there would be, yeah, so that part is possible. The other part of it is, I think what you're, what we see is a low 25 vitamin D and assume that that's the problem because there's a deficiency. But what we're not measuring is, is the body converting that vitamin D very rapidly into the activated form and the reason the 25 vitamin D is because once you have elevated 125 vitamin D, there's a re reciprocal inhibition of the conversion of vitamin D to 25 vitamin D. So it's a, it's a feedback loop that reduces the production. Why? Vitamin D doesn't just bring calcium into the blood. Vitamin D is an anti-inflammatory molecule. It's an immune suppressive formula. You don't want to be chronically suppressing vitamin D or suppressing the immune system. That's to be like taking a steroid long term. So you do, you activate it it's to reduce the immune response, but then you want it to stop so that you don't have too much. Mm -hmm. The third piece well, you talked there's, about. There's a lot of controversy, con controversy around vitamin D because I know that there are some practitioners who very strongly advocate against taking vitamin D. And what's interesting with respect to the fertility research in particular is that there's always this this link between having low levels. So I think it, it sounds like there's an opportunity for more research into how our body is actually processing it and utilizing it to ensure that we're actually, you know, converting it, utilizing it correctly. But I would, you know, it's there's with fertility in particular, whether it's related to egg quality or sperm quality or optimal menstrual cycle health, um, when we have issues of ovulatory dysfunction, whether we need to improve conversion or whether we need to improve intake, uh, we certainly need to make sure that D is optimized in these women and men. Yeah, I, I think the challenge becomes, is it correlation or causation, right? And, that, and that's one of those things that is arguable. Oh, it's, we need to eat, flood the body with more. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but what they did with, with, we can't do this in humans, but in rats, <laughs> they actually knocked out the vitamin D receptors in rats and they couldn't get fat. Interesting. Okay. That's really interesting. So when we have a $4 billion industry built around vitamin D supplementation and everybody's deficient, even though we see people taking five, 10,000 IUs a day on a consistent basis. We have to start to ask the question, is what we're well, seeing correlation or causation? And I mean, I would throw in there that a lot of people are not um, not necessarily following the dietary you know, advice that we share in real food for fertility. So they're not necessarily um, getting sufficient vitamin A. How many people are eating their liver and taking cod liver oil? How many people are optimizing their magnesium consumption and making sure to eat a diet that has sufficient vitamin K2, all of which are necessary to optimize their vitamin D? Like I said, I've seen it before where you have uh, people taking high vitamin D, but their levels aren't necessarily changing. But the question would be, well, maybe they're not taking those cofactors that are actually necessary to optimize it. And that's something that we talk about in the book as well. So I think that the, the vitamin D conversation is complicated. I would be hesitant to dissuade people from taking vitamin D, um, especially if they're looking to optimize fertility, because I think there's enough research to show that we really do need to optimize those levels, especially when it comes to fertility and pregnancy. And when women become pregnant, their need for vitamin D is even higher. But what I would qualify that by saying is that in, you know, if someone were to really follow what we're suggesting in Real Food for Fertility, we're not telling people to down, you know, zillions, I use vitamin D by itself. Like that's not the book. The book isn't like take all this vitamin D. Um, it's to optimize overall diet quality to ensure that you would naturally have those essential cofactors to be able to utilize any vitamin D that you end up taking. So I do think this is a really important point um, because taking all the vitamin D by itself without uh, you know, optimizing the overall picture is not going to solve this problem. Um, but we, we can't, you know, I, I, I don't think we can 
kind of overlook the importance of vitamin D specifically for fertility, given the the level of research r- related to egg and sperm quality and overall fertility, um, hormone balance, all the things? Well, I think all the cofactors matter, but I think one of the the issues too, from a vitamin D perspective, there aren't many foods that are rich in vitamin D. That's it's not true. how we were designed to get <laughs> yeah. it. So most of them are cold water fish, like you're talking about cod liver oil or eating cold water fish, which aren't found near yeah. these kind of equator type things. Maybe there's a reason for that because the vast majority of us are supposed to get vitamin D from sun exposure, not from our food. Well, um, as a black woman who lives in Canada, um, there's no possible, like you could argue I'm not supposed to live here. <laughs> I think that uh, I was staying um, with uh, with my parents, uh, you know, in Alberta for a couple of weeks and it was like minus 31 as a high, which is just mm-hmm. insane. That's Celsius <laughs> Listening. And so arguably, I shouldn't even live here. Um, but the reality is that especially for, you know, dark skin people, I mean, you can go outside and see the sun, but you get nothing from that in the winter. So then we're, we have a conundrum. Um, and especially given that I live in Canada, and that I'm a dark colored human. Um, I think that we have to continue this conversation and try to figure out what is the best way to to not overdose people but also to ensure people are getting optimal amounts somehow um, and also making sure to, to get those cofactors in order because I, I do see that the, the limitations of just straight supplementation without the full context. And you're right, you know, ideally we would be getting it from the sun uh, because we're very limited in terms of how we can get it through diet. Uh, one thing I learned that was really interesting years ago is that, you know, as if you're a, a white skin person to get a certain amount of vitamin D, like, so if you were to go outside in a bathing suit, you know, in a hot, sunny climate, the amount of vitamin D that your body would make in about 20 minutes would be the amount of vitamin D that my body would make if I was in a bathing suit in a sunny climate in an hour, uh, just by nature of having dark skin. And so I think it's a complex conversation that we need to continue to have just because of its mm-hmm relevance and importance and significance, particularly as it relates to fertility. Oh, yeah. Listen, I think they all matter. And I think we we definitely, there's adaptive changes in physiology and skin tinting is one of those, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily see a lot of hugely dark skin people up in the, at the equators. I mean, at the, at the ends of the earth, Right, you see them more. We get darker as we move towards more towards the equator, where we're getting more sun exposure, and it's a protective mechanism. Like, whoa, we got to protect um, the, this physiology to some degree. But I do think we have to consider sometimes today that when we're looking at labs, we have to interpret them and not just flood the system with a bunch of vitamins because a, we're not really measuring sometimes the right things. We're only measuring a piece and seeing a part of the story and then making an assumption that, oh, that is, that's de- deficient. So that's the issue. And the vitamin D, the vitamin D story is just a bigger, this, that, that just kind of highlights the story because we're only measuring one of a whole bunch of different ways that vitamin D can go and making the assumption that, that if that's low, then it, there's a deficiency versus maybe it is working the way it should. And maybe this is decreasing. This is low on purpose, not it's broken physiology. Um, and maybe what we're, maybe the reason everybody's deficient is because we don't measure it appropriately. We're not measuring the cellular level. We're not measuring the free levels. We're just measuring uh, maybe a bound level. So I think we've got a long way to go. Um, but I do think that the micronutrient status is really good. I just don't know that we know what the best way to do that, to measure it is. But I do think when we're thinking about how do we get people in the healthiest position, it primarily should come from food, whole foods versus I'm going to get this in a, in a supplement bottle. I like supplements. I think they should be used supplementally, not as the primary source. And then I think we have to start to ask um, the questions, if somebody is deficient in a lot of things on some type of a testing, do they really need a multivitamin or do they need to fix their diet, their nutrition, their digestion first? And I think that's where most people need to start, but that's not where most people start. Most people's idea of getting metabolically ready for a pregnancy is taking a prenatal, right? And yeah. they're, they're, they're not necessarily thinking, 
all right, let me reduce. I'm going to spend the next six months to a year getting rid of the processed food, decreasing the alcohol consumption, getting better sleep, reducing my emotional stress, exercising. That's not, you know, most people are like, oh, I'm pregnant, prenatal, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, that unfortunately, that's the way things go. But we've got a little bit of time left. So it, the time seems to go fast, right? You know, it's <laughs> Always does when we're having fun. <laughs> yeah. So if we were going to leave people who are like, all right, yeah, we want to, we want to have a baby. We want to get in the best shape for a pregnancy. Obviously um, you'd recommend the book, Real Food for Fertility, that they pick that up. They start listening to it, following the guidance there. But on top of that, or from that, what are like the three big recommendations that you would give anybody who's trying to get pregnant, has struggled in the past to get pregnant. What are the three like foundational things? Like if you're not doing these things, this is where you start. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great question. I think first and foremost, so, I mean, I can answer this question in different ways. Um, if I'm ta if I'm thinking about someone who is, is currently trying, um, or if I can extend it to someone who's, you know, planning to try, or even if they're planning to try in a few months, um, I do think that it's worthwhile for women to to think about the type of birth control that they're using. We haven't really talked about that a whole lot today, um, but when we use hormonal methods, they suppress ovulatory function, and it does take some time after you come off of hormonal contraceptives for your body to restore normal ovulatory function. So there's a temporary period of subfertility. It doesn't mean a person can't come off of birth control and get pregnant right away. Um, but we should be aware of that. You know, hormonal contraceptives are known to suppress ovarian reserve parameters, you know, particularly anti-malarian hormone, ovarian volume, antral follicle count. And these are some of the things that are measured when you have a couple that's struggling with fertility. So I think that it is useful to consider coming off of hormonal methods of birth control, you know, a minimum of six to 12 months before you're ready to start trying. And if you did go, if you were on hormonal contraceptives because you actually had a cycle issue, like irregular cycles or extreme pain with your periods, and that's why you were put on it, I would go even further and suggest that if you have the ability to come off even earlier than that, you know, 18 months to two years for, for someone who actually was put on contraceptives for an issue. So that would be the the first piece of information I would share. Um, another, you know, reason to consider coming off of contraceptives ahead of time is because contraceptives are also known to deplete certain nutrients, the key ones that we need for fertility, particularly B, B vitamins like folate and vitamin B12 and B6 as well as zinc and, you know, selenium and a variety of other nutrients. So I think that that is something, you know, number one, point number one. Um, mm -hmm. The second thing that I would say would be to, to start dialing in on your nutrition. You know, that preconception phase really sets the stage for your, um, your overall pregnancy. And, you know, most of us, if not all of us, we don't just want to, quote, get pregnant. We want to have healthy children. We ourselves want to be healthy. And so, um, you know, the phrase that we share at the beginning of the book is a healthy menstrual cycle sets the stage for a healthy pregnancy. And so one of the things that we want to consider is how we can optimize our nutrition so that we can optimize our hormone health. And this is really expressed through our menstrual cycle and how healthy it is. So I think that, you know, that would be number two. And uh, we've talked a lot today about how to optimize the nutrition. And so I think, you know, we've kind of covered that point. So go back and listen, but that would be huge. And the third thing I would say is to involve your male partner or for all the men listening, you are 50% of this equation. You don't get off the hook. <laughs> There's no man alive that's so healthy that he can't benefit from whether it's, you know, optimizing his diet a little more or even like a male targeted supplement to support um, male fertility. So I would say absolutely we need to be looking at male fertility as, and, and you know, here's a joke for you. You know, I'm the one that carried the babies for nine months, but all three of my kids came out looking exactly like my husband, right? Um, so good thing he's handsome. But the point is that, you know, we really underestimate the importance of optimizing his nutrition 
and his contribution because we as women are the ones that you know we we show the evidence of of the pregnancy and all of the things so those would be my top three for sure yeah so i i think those are those are great concepts and there's obviously more to the story but if if definitely six months maybe a year of trying to make sure I'm off anything that's altering my cycle. And then that also gives you time to get on a better diet, put on better nutrition, see how that helps you restart or or stabilize abnormal hormone cycles. And it gives you time to then, if they're not, you don't have normal cycles to work with somebody to say, okay, what the heck is going on here that, you know, maybe I kicked the can down the road before with birth control, but hey, what's going on now? Now I'm off the birth control. I still have the problem and it gives somebody time to help you get there. And then number three, I definitely think it's key to make sure that the partner, the male partner who's uh, in this game is part of this. Uh, I agree. Like we think about like, Hey, we just make a deposit and we're out of there. But (laughs) our, our state of health going into it is huge. I think we, women get the blame most of the time for if something's not going right. Um, and yet we know that male hormone production is going down this chronic dietary driven, immune driven, inflammatory process in men is creating a drop in testosterone levels and increase in aromatization levels in men, um, chronic inflammatory issues. And it has to impact not just the number of sperm, but the quality of those of those uh, sperm that are entering into the female to start this process, so it's critically important. So I think those are all great keys to have somebody to finish this podcast with and have somebody think about when is the book going to be released and where can they get it. Well, thank you for that. Um, The book is going to be released on Valentine's Day, uh, 2024. So we're really excited about that. I mean, fertility, love, making babies, all the things. Um, The the listeners can go to realfoodforfertility.com. And so you can find more details about about myself and and Lily, my co-author. And the book will be available on Amazon. And, you know, initially we are releasing it in paperback and ebook formats. I'm a podcaster as well. So I know everyone's going to be asking for the audiobook, which we will do later on this year. Um, but yes, yeah, so thank you so much for for having me. Such great questions today. I loved our conversation. All right, Lisa. Thanks so much. And for the listeners, please share this with your friends, family, anybody who's wants to be healthier. It's a good good conversation to, for them to hear. And definitely for those we're considering uh, getting pregnant. This is a really good conversation. So Lisa, again, once one, one more time, thanks for coming on the Thyroid Answers podcast. Thank you.